right. Well, hello, everybody. Let's see, the first service, they were like, good, hello. They got it. Y'all, most of y'all were more awake, so you understood. I didn't say good morning. Hey, let's say hello to our family joining us right now over at the North Campus and all of our family joining us at the Spring Break Campus, wherever you are watching from online. Come on, South Campus. Let's tell them how much we love them. We love you so much. Grateful that you are with us today. Well, we say we are one family. We just meet in different houses sometimes. And so y'all remember when we came to one house and y'all didn't like it. So especially here at the South, y'all were like, yeah, they're in my seat. And uh, anyway, so grateful to have more space. Speaking of space, uh, Easter or our celebration of the resurrection of Jesus is this month. It's normally next month, but for some reason it's this month and we're going to celebrate anyway on that day. Uh, But that's just two weeks away. And so I want to encourage you to be inviting people and to be bringing people. People will go to church on Easter just because it's the two times a year they feel obligated to go to church. And so we want them to come and experience the, the beauty and the power of Jesus. And you can be a big part of that by bringing somebody. And so we've given you some cards on the chair so that you can take them and invite people. Don't just invite them to, hey, I'll come pick you up. I'll sit with you in in the service if you would like. And the reason I said speaking of of space and chairs is because it's going to be a pretty full Sunday typically. So if this service is too full for you today, it will be really too full for you on uh, Easter. So you may consider going to the first service Uh, Unless the person you're inviting or bringing wants to come to this service, then don't leave them hanging. You come to this service with them. But, uh, and I'm also going to ask you to be praying for that. Be be praying not just for our church, be praying for the global church, the churches all over the world that are going to celebrate Jesus and give the gospel message that day. Be praying that people will come into the kingdom. It's a day where people's lives can get transformed. And so we ought to be praying every day leading up to that and beyond, but be praying specifically Uh, that the enemy would not stop what God wants to do on that day. Amen? Amen. All right. That was a weak amen, but I'm still going to keep going. Okay. Are y'all ready to get into the message today? We are in a series called Christ Over Everything. And I love that title because it really describes how our lives ought to be lived. And in this series, we're looking at the book of Colossians. And so as I've mentioned um, every week, is that we cannot cover every single thing in this book, so you need to be reading on your own. And I really hope that you are every week taking the particular chapter that we're studying and going a little bit deeper into it. Um, My family and I have been doing this, taking just a few verses a day through that chapter and studying it and going a little deeper, and it's been really good. So I encourage you to do that. But if you've missed any of these, let me just give you some background and context quickly. Is this uh, is actually a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Colossae. And he wrote it from prison. It's more, more than likely that Timothy, his protege, uh, was a young pastor that Paul was pouring into, actually wrote it under Paul's dictation. Okay, So that's why at the beginning in chapter 1, he says, I, Paul, with Timothy. So this letter, again, is to this particular church to deal with some things that were happening in the church. Now, we can often look at those and go, that was only happening then, that's not happening today. But how many of you know most of the things that were happening then are still happening today? And so these letters are relevant to us today to see we need to address the same things. And what Paul was writing specifically to address in this particular letter was a couple of things. One, that people really didn't believe in the deity of Jesus, that he was God, and we talked about that in week one. But he was also writing to address heresies that had got into the church and these false doctrines that had bled into the church where people began to think that they had to do certain things or live a certain way to achieve a certain status to unlock some mysteries of the gospel. And so there was this religion that was masquerading as Christianity in that church that gave God a place, but not the supreme place in their lives. And that really is the theme of this whole letter. And we've said this every week, but I really want to continue to drill into it is that Jesus didn't come to take part of your life. He came to be your life. That really is the whole theme, is the supremacy of Christ in every area of your life, that Jesus reigns supreme. And if you missed in week one, I would encourage you to go back and listen to these, to dive a little bit deeper. But we answered 
the two most important questions that everybody has. Why am I here and who am I? Who am I and why am I here? And we found that you are a creation of Jesus. You were created by him and for him. And if you understand those two things, it will inform the rest of your life. And then last week, my father, who is our founding pastor, he spoke out of Colossians chapter two. I thought he did a great job. I don't know about you, but I'm grateful uh, that our founding pastor is still here speaking to us today and that we're building upon what he has built before us. Yeah. Yeah. We're standing on the shoulders of generations before us, and I just want to challenge you, encourage you to change your thinking as well, that what we're building today is not just for us. There will be a generation that hopefully will be talking about us and what we built for them one day as they continue to spread the gospel like we are. But he talked about how we are full in Jesus and that we are complete in him and we find our completion in him. And now when you get into to chapters three and four, really, you start to get into the part of the letter that really helps us to grow and to bear fruit. It's a, it's a little more practical. And coming out of chapter two, where Paul said that if you are rooted in Jesus, so grow up out of that. That's what happens when you get rooted in Jesus. Then as you grow from that position of being rooted in him, fruit begins to come out of your life. And that's kind of what the, we're going to get into today is about our position and then getting into that fruit. So let's go into Colossians chapter three. I'm going to start in verse one. How many of you have your physical Bibles, a paper Bible? Anybody have to hold those up if you got them? Okay, yes. Hey, this service has the most of the ones that I've seen, so kudos to you over here in this service. Uh, I may not have this next month, by the way. I just, I don't want you to get, I have the Bible on my phone too. Anyway, let's jump into uh, chapter three, verse one. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth, for you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. What a powerful, beautiful four verses there. I love this picture that Paul is reminding them, you have died And when you die, you go into the ground. And if you're resurrected, that same old person doesn't come out of the ground. A new person comes out. And when you're resurrected into Jesus, you're resurrected into Jesus, not apart from Jesus. And that's this picture that he's trying to get him to see is that since you died and you've been resurrected in him, now your life is hidden in Christ with God. And that goes back to the mystery we talked about in week one. He said, the mystery is this, is that Christ lives in you. And I want to bring this point back up for us today is that if we are a new creation in Christ, we have to understand that I am in Jesus and everything Jesus is, is in me. That means that it is not my performance, but it is my position that brings about change. It's not about how hard I work. It's about my position of being in Christ and him in me that brings about the change in my life. That's an important reality because when you got saved, if you, if you truly gave your life to Jesus, he didn't really try to come to repair your old life. He didn't come to remodel the old life and make it look better. That's sometimes how we approach Christianity. That we, all right, God, why don't you make this room look a little better or I could use an addition over here. And he said, no, no, I I came to just knock the whole thing down, build a new foundation so you can be built on me and in me and with me and through me. So you're going to have new rooms. You're going to have new paint. You're going to have new furniture. I'm not coming to remodel your life. I'm coming to be your life. And that is what this, this whole chapter and really this whole letter is about. So Paul is saying, listen, if that's the reality for you, since you have died and been raised in him, then you've got to set your sights on things above or seek the things above. Look to, follow, pursue things above. That's the first thing that he's telling us. And why is he saying that? Because here's the reality. Your life will go in the direction of where you're looking. Whatever you're focused on will direct the course of your life. Have you ever been driving down the road? And looked off to the right or something and all of a sudden find yourself to the right of the road. I mean, some of y'all have, I know, because I drive with you in this town. I know, I see it. At least that's the reason, right? 
But I was driving with my wife the other day, and, and she loves to sleep in the car. She's a professional sleeper in the car. Uh, honey, I love you. She's at the other campus today. But I, we'll be driving, and I'm just, I mean, she's out, and I'm just trying, you know, I'm like listening to a podcast, or I'm distracted, talking to myself. And I'll look over and be like, oh, what was that? I didn't see that before. And the next thing you know, you hear the, you know. I'm on the side of the road a little bit, and she shoots up. She's like, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm okay. Are you okay? You know, <laughs> pretend it didn't happen. No. But like, yeah, I just got distracted. I got distracted looking out the window. I'm fine. But that's what Paul is trying to say. He's trying to say, listen, don't get distracted with things below. Why would you get so distracted with everything down here when Christ is up there? Why would you get distracted chasing after what everybody else is chasing after here with money and power and position and and the pleasures of this world when you're actually seated there? Why are you seeking the things here? That's a new reality that we have to understand. And since your life is hidden with Christ, he's saying, and he's seated in heavenly places, you have a reality greater than what you see here on this earth. And what, what I hope to get you to see today is that in Jesus... Heaven's reality should become my priorities. It said, seek the things above, the realities of heaven. And if I'm in Jesus, the realities of heaven become the priority for me on this earth. I don't live for the priorities of the world anymore. I'm living for the priorities of heaven and the realities of heaven. What are the realities of heaven? How do you think it's going in heaven right now? That's pretty good. <laughs> There's no sin, there's no sadness, there's no sorrow. There's joy in heaven, there ought to be joy in my life here on this earth. There's peace in heaven, I ought to live from that reality that there can be peace in my life here on this earth. Heaven is full of holiness, I ought to live from that reality that I can live a holy life here on this earth. In other words, when I'm seeking the things above, it's going to affect my life here on this earth and my priorities are now what heaven's priorities are. We, We seek after those things and too many people are chasing after and running after things that are so far below what God designed them to live for because they're seeking and they're focused on the things of this world. And many times they're not even bad things. We can hear that and go, well, I'm not chasing bad stuff. It doesn't have to be bad things. It can just be good things that become empty because Jesus is not the priority in them. If he's the priority in them, they are not empty anymore. But if we're chasing after things that are just self-satisfying, they become empty even when they're not bad and they're distractions for us. And he's saying, seek the things above. Doesn't that sound a lot like what Jesus said in Matthew six thirty three on the Sermon on the Mount when he was saying, everybody's seeking after what they're going to wear and worried about what they're going to eat and worried about where they're going to live. And he says, but I tell you to seek first. It's actually the same Greek word. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added to you. He's directing our attention again to look up, to seek up, not to seek down, but to seek up to the prize of heaven. Why is that so important? Because if you're living for the things of this world, then your life will be full of the things of this world. Your thoughts will be full of the things of this world. Because where you look, what you focus on, you'll begin to fill your mind with. And that's why the second thing he said is not only set your sights on the things above, but he said, set your mind on the things above. Set your thoughts, fix your thoughts. Your thought life is incredibly powerful and important. What you think about, like I said earlier with you, what you look at, what you think about ultimately will determine what you end up doing with your life, what you fill your life with. And Paul is saying, if you have a new life, you ought to have some new thoughts. There's something that's vastly different in the way that we think. We don't think about the things below. We think about the things above. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Paul was writing to a church there as well. And he says, hey, listen, don't be conformed to the patterns of this world, because you're not of this world anymore, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind or a new way of thinking. There are patterns of this world's way of thinking that just left to yourself, you'll conform to. If you don't seek the things above and set your thoughts on things above, you cannot be transformed in the way that you think. You'll just fall into that same pattern and wonder why your life ends up in the same way that everybody else's life is ending up. Pastor Craig Rochelle says this quote, I love it. He said that your life is moving in the direction of your strongest thoughts. You've got to think about what you're thinking about because it's directing your life. 
Why would we fill our thoughts with everything down here when we're seated up there? That's what he's trying to remind us of. I found that whatever you fix your thoughts on, you'll fill your life with. You, you actually will eat the fruit of whatever your thoughts are in your life. And that's a challenging thought, but the truth is, is that you, you cannot have a positive life with a negative mind. You, you cannot have a heaven-filled life with an earth-filled thought life. Because you'll get the things of earth if that's all you think about. That's why Paul in Philippians chapter 4 verse 8, another letter that he wrote, says, Fix your thoughts. It's the same idea. Set your thoughts. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about the things that are excellent and worthy of praise. What are those things? Those are things that are far above than what most other people are thinking about on this earth. Are the things of this world true? No. Are they pure? No. Are they excellent many times? No. Are they worthy of praise? Probably not. This is an elevated way of thinking, and that's what he's trying to encourage us in. Because if your thoughts are fixed on heaven and the things of heaven, your life will be filled with the things of heaven. Love and joy and peace and all those things. But if your life is, if your thoughts are fixed on the things of this world, I promise you, your life will gravitate towards the things of this world. And you'll wonder, how did I end up here? Have you ever heard that phrase, don't be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good? Have you ever heard that before? A couple people. Okay, a couple people that grew up. Thank you back there. Appreciate it. I don't think that's our problem today. I don't know too many people that are too heavenly minded. I think more people are too earthly minded that they're no eternal good. They're not living for eternity. They're not living for heaven. They're not living with the perspective of heaven in mind. They're too, they're focused with their head down, just grinding here, trying to make a living, just living out the things of this world. And, and even, like I said, it, it doesn't even have to be bad things. You could just be focused with everything going on here that you lose perspective of what's going on there. I found myself in a place like this recently where I was so heavy and I'm like why am I so heavy all the time and I realized I just had my head down so much I felt like I was underwater and I needed to get up and look at the things of heaven and go what I'm going to fill my mind and my thoughts and my life with what's going on up there why because I want heaven's perspective for earthly production in my life I need I need what's going on in heaven to begin to direct everything that I'm doing with my life It's a change of status. It's a change of a way of thinking. I have to let heaven inform my decisions on this earth. Too many people are doing that. We're letting the circumstances of this world dictate what we do. And Paul is saying, no, you need to set your mind on things above, your eyes on things above, because you're actually seated there and let the realities of heaven inform how you live your life down here. That means I have to allow it to inform my marriage. I have to allow what what the, the... culture of heaven is to inform how I spend my money here, how I get a job here, how I raise my kids here. If I own a business, that means that I need to let heaven's culture uh, inform how I run my business because it's really not my business. It's a kingdom business now. Everything should be vastly different in your life. It's a, it's a top down view instead of a bottom up view. There's a perspective that he has that I don't have. And if I can get his perspective, I can see things much more clearly on earth. That is this whole principle. And the truth is, is as Christians, our lives should look vastly different than they did before Jesus. Because you're now letting heaven dictate how you live your life. The realities of Jesus and his life dictate how you live your life. It should look vastly different. Why? Because you've had a change of status You're no longer a part of this world anymore. You're part of another world. Just like there's a picture uh, of when you give your life to Jesus, it's like a marriage. It's a covenant relationship. In marriage, when you get married, your life looks vastly different than it did before when you were single. Not enough amens on that. There's too many single people that that are married or married people that want to live single. Like, no, it's different. Your life looks different. Especially men, when you got married, your decor changed, right? There's some things that you liked. You had that leg lamp and she was like, that got to go, you know. A poster on the wall of Jordan is like, that's not in the living room. It's not going to stay. I'm sorry, right? That old ratted couch you loved. It was so comfortable. That's got to go. Your decor changes. Your clothing changes. 
<laughs> Some of that, I know that's right. You know how it changes because she says, you're going to go out like that? And they're like, what? You know? She starts to help you look a little bit different. Your diet probably changes. You're not just eating fast food every day on the way home. Maybe a home-cooked meal here and there. Uh, my, uh, my brother-in-law, when he first got married, uh, his first week of his marriage, I mean, he just was not used to being married. So he would come home from work every day when he was single, and he would pick up a Whataburger on the way home. So for the first week of marriage, he would get off work, and he would just pick up Whataburger on the way home without talking to his new wife. But that wasn't even the bad part. The bad part was he didn't bring her any. It was just, it was just him, you know. <laughs> and he was, he's not a selfish guy. Just he was in that routine. It's just what I do. You know, and listen, he's a great godly man, great husband. If he's ever watching this, uh, great husband and a great father now. But some things had to change, right? You can't just keep doing the things you used to do. Why? Because your life is now hidden in Christ, That's like a picture of you're wrapped up in him. And when you're wrapped up in him, you don't look the same that you looked before. In fact, when people look at you, they don't see you anymore. They see Jesus all around you because you're hidden in him. And that should inform how we live our lives. It's a new identity, which means that we have a new purpose with our lives. And I want you to understand that when that you live from that reality, what Paul's about to tell us is because of all of these things, now you've got to put to death some things. And, and it's important that we understand the order of this. The first two chapters here have been telling us about who we are in Jesus and that Jesus is supreme over everything and that he died and you've now been, you died as well and you've been risen with him and so you're a new person. So you have to understand all of that before you start to put some things to death. It's not that you put some things to death to get into a relationship with Jesus. You put things to death because you're in a relationship with Jesus. It doesn't earn you a relationship with Jesus. I don't do all these things so I can hope to get into a relationship. No, I do all these things because I'm in a relationship with Jesus and I love him and my life is wrapped up in him now. That's what Paul's trying to say. So look at the next verse when he says this. It says in verse five, so put to death. The sinful, earthly things lurking within you. I I love the way the New Living puts that. The word lurking is a great way to describe the way sin is in our life. It lurks beneath. He says, have nothing to do with sexual morality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. And because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. And you used to do these things when your life was still a part of this world, but now is the time to get rid of anger and rage and malicious behavior and slander and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature in all of its wicked deeds. He goes into this list of things he's saying, you got to strip this off. You got to put this to death. Why? Because those are all things that are killing your growth. Those are all things that will kill you from the inside out. That's what sin does, by the way. Sin kills you from the inside out. And he's saying, listen, you got to put to death the things that are putting you to death. You've got to kill the things that are slowly killing you from the inside out. And why, why do we need to do that? Well, he, he makes it clear here. There's two reasons. One, Because the anger or the wrath of God is coming on sin. And people don't talk about the wrath of God today, but because because God is a loving God, which he is. And he loves you so much that he doesn't want sin to destroy your life. So the wrath of God is actually aimed at sin, which destroys that which he loves, which is people. And so the wrath of God will come one day. It will be poured out one day on those who refuse to let go of their sin to receive his love. It's not love to keep both. You can't keep both. You let go of one because Jesus took it for you and you receive his love and become a different person. That is this whole picture here. And if we don't let go of our sin, that's what he's saying is going to happen. That's the first reason. The second reason is, is he says, it's not who you are. You were buried and you rose again in him, which means there's a new you that was raised from the dead and you have the power to be a new you Because Jesus paid for that sin on the cross. In fact, if you go back into chapter 2, there's such a powerful few verses in chapter 2 where he says that Jesus canceled the record of charges that have been brought against you. And he nailed it to the cross. And in doing so, it says he stripped the enemy of his power and he 
publicly shamed him. And I love that word. And by that, by the way, that's really good news for us today that you, the enemy has been stripped of his power and he's been publicly shamed. It wasn't a private shaming. It was a public shaming because he wanted everybody to see that Satan has no power over Jesus. And if you're in him, he has no power over you. That's the reality we have to live from today. And so what Paul is trying to say, since that's you, You need to live like who you are, not who you used to be. Live like who Christ made you to be with the power to overcome. Don't live like the things you used to do. He said, yeah, these things, you used to do those. But that's not who you are anymore. By the way, this is how you you help your kids. Hey, I know that's something you did, but that's not who you are anymore. You remind them of who they are. Paul is reminding us of who we are in Jesus. And it's important that we understand that because if we don't realize what Jesus did for us and that we're supposed to be a different person now or that we have the power to be a different person now, we'll just keep focusing on all these other things that we've got to quit. Just try harder. I'm just going to try harder not to fall into sexual sin. I'm just going to try harder not to cuss. I'm just going to try really hard not to think about evil desires. Too many people focus on what to stop not what to start. Too many people focus on trying harder not to do something instead of focusing on what to do. Let me, let me give you an analogy. Okay. Everybody close their eyes at both campuses online. Unless you're driving, close your eyes just for a second. Now don't think about a pink elephant. Don't think about a pink elephant with big ears. Don't think about a pink elephant with a long nose and a little yellow hat on the top of his head. Don't just, hey, I said, don't think about a pink elephant. All right, you can open your eyes. You're laughing because many of you are picturing this pink elephant with a little yellow hat. Some of you may have been really good for a minute not to picture it, but here's the reality. It doesn't change by you thinking really hard to not think about something. Just trying really hard to go, don't think about it, don't think about it, don't do it, don't do it. <clears throat> that's, not what, that's not what works. It's not about fixing our thoughts on what not to do. It is about fixing our thoughts on who he is and who he wants us to become. That's why he says, set your mind on things above. Set your thoughts, set your eyes on things. Look at who he is. Remember who you are and the things will change in your life. See, the work is to believe that you are who Jesus said you were. In fact, in John chapter 6, they said, Jesus, tell, tell us how to do the works that you do. He said, listen, the work is to believe. And out of that flows everything else. The work is to believe I am a new creation in Christ, that sin has no power over me, that I am in Christ and Christ is in me. And when we fix our thoughts and our sights on him, we begin to live from this new reality that the old nature has been taken off and a new nature can be put on because I'm a totally new person. That's what Paul goes on to say in Colossians 3.10. Look, after he said, "Take off your, strip off your old sinful nature, He says, put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. I love that. The more you know him and know who he is, you'll know who you are and you become, you'll be made into the image of Christ. And he says, in this new life, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric or uncivilized, slave or free. Listen, Christ is all that matters. And he lives in all of us. What he's saying is, is in this new life, it doesn't matter if you were rich or poor, if you were high society or low society, if you were black, white, yellow, red, brown, it doesn't matter if you grew up with great parents or no parents. In Jesus, we're a whole new race. We're a whole new people. And we're all level because Christ is all that matters is what he's saying here. And if you believe that reality, he's saying, listen, here's the point. You then have a new nature. Because you're not who you were, you're someone completely different. And if you're someone completely different with your sights set on heaven and the realities of heaven, you're now governed by the kingdom of heaven. You're governed by the kingdom of God and you you do what the kingdom of God tells you to do, which is what's found in his word. And you become a kingdom ambassador, which will make you look very different from everybody else. What did Jesus teach us to pray? Your will, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, how is it done on earth as it is in heaven? 
We begin to live on earth as it is in heaven. We reflect heaven to this earth by the way that we live, by the way that we talk, by the way that we conduct our lives and what we do. We are actually kingdom ambassadors of heaven to this earth. We're, we're not supposed to look like everybody else. We're supposed to look like visitors. You ever been somewhere and it's very clear that somebody is a tourist? Like they still have like sunscreen smeared on their face and you can see it and they have a big hat and a Hawaiian shirt and they're just got a map out and a camera around their neck. You know, they look lost, right? Sometimes, you know, we'll, we'll travel places and I don't know where I'm like looking around and my kids are like, dad, you don't look like you belong here. I was like, I don't, I don't live here. I don't know. I don't know anything here. That's how we're supposed to look now in this world. We're not from here anymore. We, we've transferred to a new kingdom. So that means our language is different. Our culture is different. Our clothing is different. We ought to look like we're just passing through here, visiting this place because that's our new reality. It, if that is a new reality for you, you will live from kingdom down to this earth, not culture up. You'll live from the kingdom of God down, the principles of heaven down to this earth. Instead of trying to live from the culture to work your way up to heaven, you'll live from heaven down to this earth. That is your new nature. I know I'm driving this point home, but it's so important because if you don't understand that reality, you'll, you'll think the same, act the same. You'll be, you'll be exactly the same person you were before. And as kingdom citizens, we don't think like everybody else. We're not preoccupied in our thoughts with the way the world thinks or with the same patterns, with worry all the time, with evil thoughts and lust constantly flooding our mind. We don't have to live with that anymore because we've set our thoughts on things above. You, you, you don't have to talk the same way everybody else talks. You can bridle your tongue. You, you can speak life and not death. You can not curse, but you can build up with your words. I know that's a challenging one for a lot of people, but this is who you are now. So you have to understand, I don't have to give into that. I, I don't act the same way everybody else acts because I have self-control now. I need some of you to remember that in the coming months, that you don't have to post everything on social media that comes to your mind. When election season rolls around, I see more Christians looking exactly like the world with the same anger, the same hate, the same frustration. We don't have to do that. We don't live for this kingdom anymore. We live from another kingdom as visitors and ambassadors to this kingdom, right? I'm making that really clear to you today because the whole point of Colossians is Christ over everything, right? And here's the truth we need to understand today is that if Jesus is over everything, he changes everything. If he's truly over everything in your life, he's gonna begin to change everything in your life. And in love, I would tell you, if he hasn't changed everything in your life, he may not be over everything in your life. If he hasn't changed your words, have you really put him over your words? Have you said, no, he's the priority in this. If he hasn't really changed your thought life, have you said, no, he's the priority in my, is he really over it? Do I surrender it to him? Because when he's over it, I promise you, he will change it. You won't be the person that you were before. Why? Because there's been a change in status. There's a change in a relationship. Marriage is one of the greatest pictures of this. I've already alluded to this once, but when you get into a relationship with Jesus, it's a marriage covenant and things, things are different now, right? Just like when I married Tandra, my wife, I don't have eyes for other women anymore. I have eyes for her. My affections aren't for anybody else. My affections are for her. My life is preoccupied with her now. I'm not chasing all these other things because she's the object of my affection. It's the same thing in your marriage with Jesus. He becomes the object of your affection and everything else in your life begins to change out of that desire to be found in him and him and you because you're one now, just like in marriage. And here's some encouraging news for you. That if Jesus is over everything and changes everything, you have to understand that not only your, your past changes, but your present and your future changes. Look, look at this in verse three and four, what he said already. It says, for you died to this life and your real life. This is now your real life, he's saying. Your real life is hidden with Christ and God. And when Christ, who is now your life, is revealed, the whole world... Uh, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. Why is that so important? Because most people like this one, we like to believe this first part, that your sinful past is dead. 
That's good news, and that's the truth. Your sinful past is dead. But heaven is your present reality now. And reigning with Jesus is your future glory. Because when you make him over everything, he's over your past, he's over your present, and he's over your future. Your past, your sinful past being dead and gone is good news. You should celebrate that. But living from heaven to this present reality will inform all of your decisions going forward. And you can live with the hope that no matter what happens in this world, I'm going to reign with Jesus in future glory forever and ever. That is the hope of the believer and it informs and changes every part of our life when we live from this reality that Jesus is over everything he changes everything in me in fact it's what it's what verse 11 said Christ is all that matters can we live from that place today that says Christ is all that matters he's everything He's everything in me. He's everything to me. He's directing every part of my life. My life is submitted to him. And when you understand that new reality, here's the good news for you. You can say this today. You can say, because I'm in Jesus and Jesus is in me, I have the power to change. Not from my own ability. I can put things to death because he already put it to death. And he is living in me and he is living through me. And I now become heaven to people on this earth. I become a reflection of of heaven. I don't know about you, but I am so grateful when I read these scriptures today that Jesus can change everything in my life, that he, he is Lord over my past, he's Lord over my present, and he's Lord over my future, and I can rest secure in that today. How many of you say, I'm grateful for that today? Amen. Would you bow your heads with me at both campuses? I just want to lead us in a time of prayer, and how we like to end many of our services, just saying, Holy Spirit, what are you speaking to me? You know, we, we, we've read the scripture. We've seen who we are in him. We see his purpose and his plan for our life. Is that he wants, to, he wants to get right into your world and change everything around you. Not because you can do it by yourself, but your position in him is what allows that to happen. Maybe today you've had that revelation. And I just pray today, God, for those who feel under the weight of worry, under the weight of anxiety, that are their thoughts are fixed on those things and their eyes have been so focused on the things of this world. I pray today, God, that they would just look up. For those who need to hear this, just look up. Set your mind on things above. Give God your worry. Give God your anxiety. Say, God, from the perspective of heaven, how do you want me to live this life? And I just pray for a fresh revelation of that today. I pray for people who felt like they had no hope to feel hope today. For people who felt heavy coming in today, that they would leave light today and trusting that you are guiding them, you are leading them, God. That they can live from heaven's perspective today in this world. And it's going pretty well there thank you for that today, God. And I pray for everyone here today who has not made Jesus truly the Lord of their life, God, that they would make that decision today. And just with every head bowed and every eye closed, I feel like I should tell you that if you're not in Jesus, if you've not surrendered your life to him, then your present reality is sin. Like you, you cannot overcome it by yourself. You cannot live for Jesus apart from Jesus being in you and living through you. It's it's impossible to do. Or maybe you're here today and and you're not in Jesus like we've been talking about. And I just want to tell you in the most loving and caring way that I can that your future is not in glory reigning with him right now. Your future is eternity apart from him unless you give your life to him. And I tell you that in love because it doesn't have to stay that way. The status can change today if you'll surrender your life to him. So I I can think of no better time than to give you that opportunity here today. So with every head bowed and every eye closed at both campuses, I just want to ask, is there anybody here that would say, would raise their hand and say, that's me. I don't, I have not made Jesus the Lord over everything. I'm not truly following him and I want to do that today. Would you just slip your hand up and let me know if there's anybody here today that would say, I want to make sure my future is secure in him. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else would say, I want to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Multiple hands. Praise God. Well, here's what I want us to do at both campuses. I'm going to ask you to stand. And as you stand, those that raise your hand, I'm going to ask you to take another bold step. And I'm going to ask you to come just meet me right here at the altar. Because you're taking a step out and saying, I'm going all in for Jesus. And you're not ashamed of what anyone else thinks. So let's all stand together. And let's encourage those that made that decision to just come and meet me right here at the altar. Come on, you can just come out right now. You raise your hand, come in here. Come on, that's good. Praise God. 
Come on down. Anybody else? Come on, let's keep cheering for them. What was your name? What's your name? Netra. Netra? Nice to meet you, Netra. What's your name? Kelsey. Nice to meet you. Come on down, brother. I met you before. Remind me of your name one more time. That was Carrington. Such a cool name. Thank you guys for coming down. Come right here. I'm just going to... I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and this is the most important decision that you'll ever make in your life. And it's not the prayer that saves you, we always say. It's what you mean and what you do from this point forward. You're just confessing. This is a public confession among the safest people in the world who are loving you and cheering for you, and you're now part of the family of God. So let me pray with you, and I want you guys to repeat after me. And I'm going to ask all of us, let's just make this confession to Jesus as well. Just say, Jesus, I give you my life. God, I want to follow you for the rest of my days. Come and live in me. Change everything in my life. I'm yours. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, can we celebrate that? Greatest decision you guys will ever make. I'm so proud of you.